Okay, so welcome to my talk. My name is Justus, and I'm going to talk a little bit about virtualization from the HERT perspective. And let me just quickly introduce the HERT to you, because I believe a lot of people just know the stupid jokes about it never being done and released. And first of all, what is the HERT? The HERT is a general purpose multi-server microkernel based operating system and the GNU project intended it to be a replacement for the Unix kernel and as we all know that didn't happen but I think there's still a lot of value in the herd because first and foremost it exists and this is highly uh, compatible so we built on the GNU C library, and we have a FAT C library. So most applications just need to be recompiled. Of course, there are bugs and quirks and stuff like that, but it's highly compatible. Also, you got uh, Debian GNU Hurt, so you can install it like Debian GNU Linux, and you will feel at home, I promise. Um, it is also a great place to contribute to learn system programming and maybe to learn how to work in a project or in a GNU project. And I think the most important thing for me was that it freed my mind from a really narrow perspective of what an operating system is and can do for me and for users. And really the hurt is about um, the first freedom, the ability to run a program as the user wishes. And it gives me freedom, for example, from my, um, if I work at a, on a system that I don't control, I'm an unprivileged user. I still want to do crazy stuff on that machine. Or even if I, if it's my own machine, you know, I want to run any program in the environment that I want and I control to a greater extent than it is possible on, on Linux, say. Uh, so what about virtualization? It's everywhere, that's, uh, that's, that's clear. And people do it for different reasons. So maybe they do it for development or for, you know, the, gun the cloud <coughs> stuff is about maintenance mostly. And some people do it for security. Whatever the reason, virtualization is everywhere. And there are different kinds of virtualization. So you <coughs> might have s whole system emulation or virtualization like Box or QEMU. Or you might want to virtualize just a tiny part of the system. So it differs in grain, grain granularity, right? Mm. And back in, two, in 2012, I was here and I watched a talk from uh, this Italian professor, Renzo Davoli. If I mispronounce his name, I'm sorry. And he came up or he provided a very general definition of what virtualization is. And he said it's the ability to interpose any resource. And I like that, mm, but I would uh, say it a bit differently. I want to um, shape the execution environment of my, my programs <coughs> in any way I like. This is the point for me, the important point. So we do have a coarse-grained virtualization mechanism in HERT, and it's sub -HERT. And it's, it's a bit about like um, I don't know, zones or containers or LXG. And what it does, it gives you another, well, another view of the system and it, you replace the whole system. And it's tricky actually to do this on monolithic systems because there you have everything or every resource implemented in the kernel. And if you want to do some thing like containers, you have to introduce namespaces in the kernel. 
And the Linux community has been doing that for like a decade now. And I'm not even sure they, they finished. And even, even if they did, the security of the system always depends on the implementation. If there is a bug, well, you break out of, of the namespace, I don't know, environment. The nice thing is that it's kind of trivial on multi-server operating systems because you just have to start another set of processes that implement all the resources. So this is how it looks like to start a subpart. You do, uh, we have this program called boot and you give it a device or it could even be a file. And this file contains, or this block device contains an X2 image, for example. And then boot mimics what grub and mark does uh, when starting a real herd system. So it loads the initial servers and it uh, executes this weird scripting language called boot script. And you can see this here. So we load the file system server and we pass this uh, pseudo root device to it. This is, uh, this is the thing that's different on the real hub. And then we load the exec server that executes processes. And then the whole uh, server bootstrap just starts. And what you he see here is uh, a screenshot of starting a Debian GNU herd system that I installed using Deb Bootstrap and I just tweaked it a tiny bit. It's basically the, the herd system runs unmodified inside and it's just the Debian bits that don't quite cope with the subherd environment, but it works to a large extent. So, how does it actually work? Um, well, we just start another set of servers, like the PROC server that uh, implements processes and the file system servers and the exec servers. It's a completely separate set. And it actually virtualizes very few things. Most kernel objects like uh, tasks and, uh, I don't know, memory management is just used as is. Um, up to HERT 09, which we released in December last year, um, we had to run subherts from a privileged user, that is root, basically. And under this model, <coughs> the virtualized resources were the console so that you could um, see and type stuff, and the root device and the time device. And to, for the mark device setup, you, you have this, uh, this um, device master port that you use to look up devices. So that was uh, virtualized. So in 09, we introduced um, Unprivileged, unprivileged subparts, and it was actually not that much to do. So the only thing that was needed is to get task ports for the newly uh, created tasks. Tasks are the mark equi equivalent of um, processes. So what was needed is a way to hand task ports to the unprivileged boot process. And we added that, and you know, we know uh, through a mechanism called uh, task notifications. And we added another privileged kernel port stop that we don't have because we are running unpriv unprivileged. <coughs> and um, yeah, stuff like that. It's actually not a big change. And the nice thing about this boot pro program is that it's, it's tiny. It's like 2,600 lines of code, which is for a C program not that big. And it actually contains a lot of stop functions and this weird 
bootstrap parser thing. So it's quite simple to, to do coarse-grained virtualization on a microkernel multi-server based operating system. But that's actually not the, the interesting thing for me because I want to do fine-grained virtualization. And one central design aspect of the herd is that every service is looked up through the virtual file system. So we have the slash dev directory containing all the what Unix called device nodes. And in the herd, it's, it's <coughs> nodes, and they are connected to servers. So we've got dev null and stuff, zero, uh, the, the block devices. And then we have this set of herd servers under slash servers. Like <coughs> the crash server, if a process dies, it talks to the crash server and creates a core dump or whatever. And we have the startup server that manages uh, the system startup. And we also got the server socket directory, and it contains our network stack, our network uh, servers. And we don't have a, a central configuration on how, to, how this should look. But what we do is um, that every node in our file system can contain a a translator record, which is basically a, a, com um, a command line. And on access, a herd server is spawned. This is a bit like socket activation, but more general and in a distributed way, and done in the 90s. So the Linux forks are a bit late. <laughs> and as an example, this is how our network stack looks like. And Showtrans is a program that can query the translator records. And we have this dev net DDE, which is uh, Linux device drivers running in user space. And then we have uh, a simple program, a dev node, for the Ethernet device. And it looks up uh, the Ethernet device through the NetDDE driver stack. And then on top, I layered um, the Ethernet multiplexer, which is an Ethernet bridge. And it is connected to the primary Ethernet device. And then finally, on top of all that, we have uh, the Linux uh, TCP IP stack. And it sits on this node, and it talks to one of the nodes provided by the Ethernet multiplexer. So this is our network stack. So we heard uses a terminology. We have a thing called uh, translators. And what is a translator? <coughs> a translator is a, a server and it exposes a certain interface. <coughs> and why is it called a translator? It's called a translator because it translates between you know, one domain and the set of uh, virtual file system operations, and maybe more. So the virtual file system operations are described in the file heard file system definitions. This is our our file system protocol. We heard as a set of protocols and we have a reference implementation. So this is the file system protocol. And there are operations like dir lookup and you give it a node and a path and a set of flags and maybe a mode if you want to create a file and you get another mo node. And sometimes you want to extend this to allow for more operations, because a bit like the uh, plan nine, we say everything is a file, and then we don't want to communicate byte streams on top of this file system interface, but we have uh, structured data being passed around, and we have uh, RPC definitions to 
and we get uh, client stops and server stops created for it. This is how it looks like if we trace a program, we do stat on etc hostname. And what we see is we send a dear lookup message to this, uh, this is the path and the flags and the mode and so, and we get back another port. Port is a reference to a capability. Mm. And as I said, the design aspect is that the virtual file system is used for server lookups and almost every server in the herd is accessible using the virtual file system. And for me, there is this set of underappreciated uh, family of translators. And it's the family of translators that just modify the map from the virtual file system to the virtual file system. Using that kind of translator, we can modify the view one process has on, on the system as a whole. So every process has a, a working directory and a root directory, similar to how it's implemented on other Unixes. And we can manipulate the root directory <coughs> using uh, setrans, change root. It's not change root in the Unix sense, but it allows us to start a process with the uh, with new uh, root directory. And we can provide a server that uh, provides this root directory to the, um, to the service. This is how it looks like. So we do set runs, change root. We want to execute this command and we want the root directory to be provided by the remap translator and we want to remap etc hostname and we want to substitute it with uh, my hostname, some other file. And then this program is run and you see not the hostname but my file. So I successfully exchanged a global configuration file in the Unix way with my own file. And I strongly believe that this is something that I, as a user of a computer, should be allowed to do. And because every server in the herd is accessible through the virtual file system, using this very simple technique, we can, uh, for example, replace the server socket 2, which is the, um, the, the network translator for the internet family with my own server and start some program using it. This way, if my TCP IP stack uses a VPN, I get all of the network traffic routed through my VPN. And this is on a per process base. So this is a very powerful way of doing virtualization. So I played around with this idea and I came up with the simplest possible translator. And it's the, it is the identity translator. It proxies all requests, but it doesn't alter them in any way. And if it is used like a traditional translator in the herd, um, you can actually mount uh, file systems or stuff like that by attaching um, translators to some node. And if we do this with the identity translator, so I'm attaching to the node mount the identity translator and I feed it some directory as the underlying node, which is a bad name for, I would call it, the input of the function. And now it behaves a bit like a symlink, so I just see the content of the directory. But there is a very important uh, difference because if I 
do an LS on this, um, what is happening is that the, the identity translator does the lookup for me. So the lookup is executed with the privileges of the um, identity translator, which is kind of a problem, but it's okay if I'm the one who is actually starting the identity translator. This is one of the open problems, how this kind of um, server interacts with the herd authentication model. But I think it's okay for personal translators. And I can query the what translators attach the node using this function, and it says it's the identity translator. And if I use it with the change root uh, command, it actually implements change root, the, the Unix change root. And we have a change root on the herd, and it's implemented in the file system servers, and it's a bit like a hack. And this is a nice way to implement a change root because I have an external server that provides a, way, um, a view on, the, on some resources. And I just start my, pro my program, like LS or Shell or Firefox or whatever, using this as the root directory. And it doesn't actually stop there, because now we can go crazy, and we can implement an TPG translator. And by the way, these are actually implemented. They are kind of prototypes, but it works, as I show it here. And I have this, um, this translator, Herc GPG, and I have a, a wrapper around it because it's cumbersome to use that, that trans change route to set it up. But now I can just do verify, and this starts the, the PGP translator. And I do tar go fetch this uh, archive over FTP from the GNU archive. And when it does that, it actually goes ahead and verifies the signature that is distributed with this um, tarball. And only if the verification succeeds, it allows me to open that file. Likewise, it allows me to encrypt a tarball. So I say encrypt for some address and then create a tarball. And it actually creates an encrypted tarball. So this is stuff that you can do. Finally, I believe that virtual machines or virtualization technology like VMware or Box or stuff like that is popular because um, it's easy to explain. If I fire up a virtual machine and it's just like a physical machine. This is a good picture for the mind. And it's not, I think it's very important to explain the operating system to the users because it's important if, you, if we want to empower a user, we need to explain the system to the user how it is composed. And this gets even more tricky if we start with the distributed system like the herd. And I have a prototype for that that I want to demo. And there are two aspects to it. The first aspect is uh, explaining how the system looked like at a global level. And the second is how to explain the relation between tasks. Okay, wish me luck. Uh, let's see. So, nice, huh? <laughs> this is actually a tree, and this is the root of the tree. And then we have uh, slash dev, and it looks a bit like a snowflake. It contains all the device nodes. And then we have slash run, which is a 
a temporary file system. And if I mouse over it, it shows me some additional information about this. And we can see here is slash servers. And we have sockets. And here, oh, here is my TCP IP stack. And I first tried to do this with, uh, with generating static, um, static images using graph bits. But this completely failed because you get huge images that are hard to comprehend and hard to display. So I opted for, a, for an interactive exploration tool. And this, this is my prototype. Um, and the other thing that you can do with it and need to restart it. Okay. Oh no. <coughs> awesome. Okay. So this is my process. This is the Hurt Web UI. And it's actually connected to other tasks, like you know, the proc server that implements the process, uh, the the concept of a process of a POSIX process. And for some reason, it has a connection. Oh, what you are seeing is a directed graph, and we you see an edge. If uh, if this uh, process has a uh, a port or handle to an object implemented by the server. So this edge says, for some reason, I don't know, the process opened def random or def random, I don't know. And so this is the proc server, this is the uh, TCP IP stack, the local network stack, this is the root file system, this is the authentication server. And we can actually start from there to explore, explore the system. For example, this is the terminal. Oh. And I can ask what other processes have opened the terminal by double clicking on this. And I see that there's my shell that also has a port to the terminal and sudo because I started the program with privileges because it has to be privileged to probe into all the other processes. And we can ask, you know, what other kind of uh, programs are using the TCP IP stack? A bunch. It's awesome what the JavaScript world can do, huh? Um, and we see, actually, here's the Ethernet multiplexer. And if I open it, oh, it works better with a bigger display. We see it has uh, a connection to the uh, device driver, which is to be expected. Oh. So to conclude, from my point of view, being able to manipulate the virtual file system is a way to do fine-grained virtualization on the herd. And it's actually surprisingly easy and fun to do on a multi-server um, operating system. And if you're interested, you should actually come talk to us, join us, do some fun stuff with it. And you can imagine all kinds of servers that do similar things to this. So maybe we can have a gigs translator because uh, there are people working on porting GNU gigs to the herd or the other way around or both. And Manoli sits here and he's going to give a talk about that tomorrow. I hope that's up to date. And if you haven't already, you should go ahead and watch the previous talk because the previous talk was about the same thing, 
mostly, but for the G-Node operating system. And it's interesting to see their perspective on this. So if you're interested, go ahead and watch it. And if you want, there are two fun papers. Both are called, Are Virtual Machine Monitors Microkernels Done Right? The one argues pro, the other contra. <laughs> and it's a nice introduction to you know, different ways on the, on the world. <coughs> and that's it. I'm happy to accept the question. So the question is about the web server. It's actually running on the, the Hertz system. This one, by the way, Hertz is running on actually hardware. <laughs> um, not on new hardware, but on hardware. Um, and it's actually gathering the information from the system. It's, uh, we have this, this thing called port info, which does the same thing, but not with the you know, JSON interface. So it was very interesting. I know almost nothing about Hertz. So maybe my question would be naive. But you compared it to Plan 9 a couple of times. And I wanted to know if you are able to actually run different serv servers on different machines to run, like, like Plan 9 can do. And is the VFS, I think, able to talk about the network and just talk to other VFS? So the question was whether we can have um, the heart running across uh, different machines on a network, and if it provides a single system image kind of interface, the answer is no. Um, Mark was designed to allow that, but it was lost or never really implemented. And I know there is a guy working on net message that is able to uh, send Mark messages across the network. And I haven't tried it, but apparently it, it works to some degree, I, I don't know. So it's possible in theory, but it's not our focus. <coughs> oh yeah, sure. Uh, just a speculation, I'm, I don't know too much about it either, but yeah. when SMTP support gets into HERD eventually, in the future, somewhere, and you know, don't know when, what would the impact on sub herds be uh, in terms of of privileges and I mean a subherd could potentially a hog um, hog its host. So. Right. <laughs> so the question is about SMP support and whether how it uh, impacts um, subherds. So Mark has been always SMP capable, capable, but currently our version of Mark only runs on 32-bit X uh, Intel processors and we don't do SMP, sorry. And if we would, that would be nice. Then again, and the second part was about whether one subheart can hawk resources like the processors. Accounting, basically. Uh, accounting, we don't do accounting, and that's a huge problem. <laughs> and uh, so we don't have a good answer for, um, for uh, denial of service attacks, basically. If, if you need that, you should probably look at Gnode. Um, I can look at Mac. I need to look at Mac. Better. It's possible to implement that in Mac. Everything is possible in theory, but it would um, require a huge amount of work to bring Mac up to speed. You probably wanted to avoid it, but I still ask the question if you are talking about different kinds of virtualization, so what about some kind of hardware assisted virtualization when you really need, for some reason, I don't know why, to run a different uh, OS image? So the question is whether we want to use hardware virtualization if you want to run a, a different uh, operating system. And sure, if you want to do that, we should. Uh, port uh, QEMO and stuff like that. Uh, someone would have to do it 
I'm, I'm not that interested in that because I think this is more fun. Yeah, but from the architectural point of view, where would the hypervisor reside? It would be, in the, it would be an extension to the, to the Mac kernel or it would be a user space component or is there a, some, some road, road plan for that? <coughs> So the question was uh, whether it's possible to implement that in the kernel or maybe also in user space, a hypervisor. I'm not sure. We do uh, device drivers in user space, so maybe it's possible to uh, implement some or most of that in user space too. I don't know. Yeah, regarding the two papers, are virtual machine monitors, microkernels done right, don't you think? Heiser is in a better position because he can refer questions to his colleague and probably co-worker with the words, talk to the hand. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a snarky remark about the papers and the one author uh, being named hand. So the other one can say, talk to the hand. Lots of fun papers, you should read them. It's about uh, mostly about Zen, and uh, the first paper argues that Zen is a better way to approach the problem uh, because of this and this and this. And the other paper refutes these claims by interpreting the Zen architecture from a microkernel point of view, and it's, it's a fun read. So which paper was published or written first? You know? Yeah, the first one. And this is from the Zen, Zen people, and it's uh, pro. And the other one was written later, and it's contra. All right. Any more questions? I guess not. Then thank you.